So there are some indulgent things and ways that we use uh, water, but there are also some really serious new demands for water that we need to pay attention to. And the one I'd like to focus on, really the poster child, is ethanol use. Now, I don't have a dog on the, f on the fight on whether ethanol is a good or bad return on investment for the energy produced. You get into some complicated stuff. Instead, I will tell you this. U.S. energy policy has developed in utter disregard of the water implications of the policy. And this is classically the case of ethanol. It takes, in a, in a plant that refines ethanol, it takes as much, even a new plant that recycles water, it takes as much as four gallons of water to refine one gallon of ethanol. So a, a 50 million gallon plant would basically be a, uh, a 200, 200 million gallons of water, and you can see they're dotted all over the, all over the country. But, but that turns out to be the drop in the bucket, because first you have to grow the corn. And corn's a very thirsty crop, and, and if you grow corn uh, in a place like California or Colorado or Kansas, Nebraska, you're talking about 2,500 gallons of water to grow enough corn to refine one gallon of ethanol. Well, now you start to do the multiplication tables, and that's a lot of zeros at the end about how much water is involved in producing, in producing ethanol. And the latest energy phase to come along is fracking, and I expect you've heard a bit of that in the last few days. There are some very serious quality issues associated with the chemicals they use in fracking and also with the water that they pump back out. But I just want to concentrate on the water itself. It's not a lot of water per well as water goes. It's 5 million gallons. It's not a drop in the bucket, but compared to how much water farmers use, it's not much. The problem with fracking is a lot of it is going on in places that are already water stressed. So when you start to talk about new wells at 5 million gallons per pop, you start to exacerbate the tensions over water use that are already in place. But all of this is driven by our seemingly insatiable demand for energy. We just have to have energy and appliances and phones and, and, and computers and tablets and, and videos that, that we use. And this is a company that, that does that for us. And they, they need a heck of a lot of water. But you would never guess what company it is. It's Google. Google? Wait a minute, I thought they had that Mountain View campus with massage parlors and, and, and people that feed you sushi and stuff like that. Isn't, that. isn't that the job of being a Google employee? Well, that's the job of writing the code, but when you press that search button on your engine or you upload a piece of video, then what cranks up is this. It's what Google calls, it's the inside of that building. It's a server farm or a data center. So you've heard about the cloud? Well, where is the cloud? Well, it's not in the air, it's in these industrial buildings scattered all around the United States. There are tens of thousands of them, each of which can take as much energy as a decent-sized city. And our desire for seven nines reliability to figure out what have the Kardashians been tweeting? Or, or did, do you know that a hundred hours of video are uploaded on YouTube every minute. One hundred hours. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. The videos of your cat are not that interesting. So it takes a lot of energy to produce water, and it takes a lot of water to produce energy. In California, one-fifth of all of the electricity that's used is just moving pieces of water around and treating it but we've paid no attention to how much energy we're using, where it comes from, and what its implications are. Okay, well then what are we going to do? The supply is limited, the demand is going up, and not just frivolous stuff, energy is an important demand. What are we going to do about it? Well, first thing is, here's a billboard from the state of Michigan. I lived in Michigan for a bit, taught, taught in Michigan. And this shows you there what they think the Southwest wants, to come into the Great Lakes and put a straw into each one of them and take all the water to the southwest. So whenever I'm in the Midwest and I get back there with some regularity, I put this up and I, I say, shame on you. This is a scurrilous attack on those of us in the southwest. The idea that we want to divert all of the Great Lakes is silly. How about we just divert one of the smaller ones? <clears throat> 
So there are people still proposing such things, diverting icebergs from the Arctic towing, uh, and towing them south, diverting a river from British Columbia, though seldom do they ask the Canadians whether they think this is a good idea. And my last, uh, my most recent example is a fellow in Colorado who wants to build a pipeline. So it starts way in the upper left at Flaming Gorge Dam there, and he's going to have the pipeline track the I-80 corridor all the way over past um, Laramie, Cheyenne, down to Denver and Colorado Springs. Now, I don't have time to go through all of the obstacles that Mr. Millian faces before he can pull this project off, but, but I will mention one, and that's something called the Rocky Mountains. So, what else are we going to do? If long-distance pipelines and icebergs in the Arctic are silly ideas, which they are, what else are we going to do? Well, business as usual means one of three things. Divert more water from rivers. Oh boy, we've done a good job of that. Such a good job that many rivers are in life support. And I don't mean little streams. I mean the Rio Grande, the Colorado. They don't even reach the ocean anymore. So diverting more water from rivers is probably not such a good idea. Second thing we typically do is we build more dams. And as this uh, photo shows you, graph shows you, we're really good at building dams. We have been building one dam a day since Thomas, Jefferson built, uh, since Thomas Jefferson signed the Declaration of Independence. Where else are we going to build new dams? Truth is, you're not. The era of dam building is over, and what we're doing now is we're actually taking dams out. From the Penobscot in Maine, and the, and the, and the Edwards to, uh, to the Klamath in Oregon, we're taking out river, uh, dams and restoring thousands of miles of free-flowing rivers. That's the direction. And even if you wanted to put in a new dam, many of the dams don't fill up already. So putting another dam on a river where you don't have enough water to fill the first dam really doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense. The third thing we do customarily is we drill groundwater wells. I think you'd be surprised to know just how recent a phenomenon that is. Large-scale commercial wells capable of pumping five or 600 gallons a minute, that only became common in the mid-20th century. But since then, we have rushed to, to deplete our aquifers, largely because pumping is unregulated. Uh, to this day, as we sit here this morning in California, and I mentioned Georgia, there's virtually no regulation on pumping from, from California wells, and it's creating a real problem. Uh, Overpumping of aquifers can create earth fissures, so earth literally opens up as the waters are moved. Uh, here's a sinkhole in, in Florida. Uh, scores of lakes in Florida have dried up from groundwater pumping. This is the scene, uh, you may have read a year and a half ago about this poor guy who went to bed and his house collapsed in the middle of the night. They still haven't found his body. Um, that was from overpumping of groundwater. And here's a slide that's positively scary from the San, San Joaquin Valley. Can you see that at the top of the slide, oh, it's not on the screen. Oh, yeah, that's too bad. The top, I get cut off on, on this. The top is 1925. So imagine the year 1925, that's where the land was. And the land has literally, land has literally dropped 25 feet. And, and this was in the 70s. And it's continuing to drop about eight or 10 inches a year. And well, how does that happen? I'm glad you asked. Um, so imagine the last time you bought a box of Kellogg's cornflakes, and you got it home, love cornflakes, you open it up, and the first thing you think is, Kellogg's has ripped me off. It's like the box is this tall, but the flakes are only up to here, right? It's like fraudulent advertising, this huge box and a few flakes. No, no, no. When they filled the box, they filled it, but the flakes get jostled and they settled in transit. If they had put two cups of milk in with the flakes, the flakes would still, up to, still be up to the top of the box. Well, that's what's happening in the Central Valley. Without support of water, you're creating air pockets by having removed the water and the, and the earth is gradually compacting. <clears throat> then there are some environmental problems, really about rivers. Because if you think about it, why is it, why does a river have water if it hasn't rained? And that's because the river is always at the low point and the land is above it, and subsurface water is moving gradually down gradient to, uh, to provide uh, water. Here's a before and after photograph from a river just outside of my hometown of Boston. 
This isn't the Southwest. This is the Northeast. This is a state that gets more rain than Seattle, and yet groundwater pumping has dried up the Ipswich River. So if you think about what we're going to do, I don't think business as usual is a, a viable solution. More diversions, more wells, more dams. That's just not viable. Well, what, what might be viable? Well, some people think we can modify weather. This is called cloud seeding, and there are people trying to do exactly that. You shoot some silver iodide up into the, up into the air, and, and really you hope it, you hope it rains. Um, <clears throat> scientific community is agnostic about this. They say you can't replicate the before and after. You can't show that you got more rain. Even if you shoot the cannon off and it rains, how do you know it wouldn't have rained anyway? Or how do you know it rained more than it would have? It's some very devilishly difficult uh, cause and effect problems. But I just ask you whether, do you want your water supply to depend on these two characters? Yeah, I, I didn't think so. So I don't think cloud seeding is viable. 